I'm here, gang. Right, I knew it. I knew I'd make it. I always do. Oh, oh before we get started here tonight, I'd like to give you a, uh, a, a tonight's report on the advancement of our society. Uh, you know, getting rid of the old Victorian taboos. Have you seen a good Victorian taboo recently? I don't know where you can pick one up cheap these days. I, I just, uh, they're, good. they're getting to be collector's items, you know, and they're very expensive. You know, with the fringe on the bottom, especially the ones with the stained glass. Very, very expensive. However, uh, <laughs> speaking of Victorian taboos, uh, <laughs> I, I don't know quite how to say this, but uh, madness is getting rampant. Uh, I just have to say it. I am on the mailing list of all kinds of cockamamie outfits. I mean, I get more... Uh, junk mail, probably, than your average owner of your average authentic junkyard. I get junk mail. I mean, really junk mail. For example, I am on the mailing list of a porny magazine. Now, they send me the magazine all the time. They really do. See, as for promotion, uh, it, it just comes, you know, it says for promotion. And uh, it comes in a brown sealed wrapper. And it's so funny, the wrapper always has... Uh, smudge prints all over it uh, of thumbs. Obviously, uh, the mailroom has discovered that the, that the plain brown seal wrapper contains a nice collection of uh, Victorian taboos. And uh, so nevertheless, it comes every month, see? And I've been getting this thing for about uh, a year. And they also send me news releases, see, uh, along with it, like a hot flash. Uh, I use that phrase expressively. It says, hot flash in this week's issue. The exciting story of a Danish pornography photographer on his daily rounds as he auditions lovely, luscious Danish goodies. And uh, it's just a big, special, exclusive story this month. So, you know, it's very exciting. I keep getting these, uh, these <laughs> news releases. So the other day, though, I got the final one, I think, which says it all so much today. It says, uh, it says uh, Dear Editor, they keep calling me Editor. Of course, that was the name I was using at one time. Uh, Samuel L. Editor is the name I used when I worked in Lexington, Kentucky. I had a, a wooden walnut gaff going at the time. And, and so that name has persisted and has followed me. So uh, it says, Dear Editor, it says, uh, this is sent for your special consideration. And it was in red type, you know, very important. It said, due to the fact that our country is still in the grip of old Victorian taboos, and uh, anybody who's walked through Times Square recently knows that Victorian taboos are certainly, certainly really oppressing all the libidos of our, of our time. I'm telling you, there's more libidos being repressed by Victorian taboos. One of the saddest things I saw recently was a Sunday school class. Uh, you saw it, Lee. It was a Sunday school class, and they were all assembled on a sidewalk right in, the, in Times Square, you know, and their yellow bus was out there, and they all had their little folders, and they were going to go to some big thing, see? And... Uh, and they were all standing out on the sidewalk on Times Square. And uh, they all had their little midi blouses on and, the, you know, the clean limb kids. It must have been about 25, 30, maybe 40 of them from somewhere out in Pennsylvania someplace. They were their big yearly trip to New York, see. So here they were, and they were all standing out there. And, and here was the uh, the reverend, and he had the uh, the role, and he was calling the role, and he was standing there looking very very official, and this nice, big, heavy-set lady with a corsage was standing next to him, and she had her clipboard, and they were all set to go out and see the town or do something, see. But where the irony came in, here they were all standing there looking all excited, and they had their little brochures. They were standing right under a gigantic marquee, and the marquee says, Sex Girls of Europe, 17 smash porny films, XXX rated. <laughs> I mean, it was like the Alpha and the Omega of our time. Uh, I've noticed that, uh, that uh, well, Nathaniel West, you see, could see this kind of stuff. Rex Reed can't. But uh, nevertheless, I'm, I'm standing there, you know, looking at this crowd, and I thought, oh, God, here it is. It's all spread out. I, I guess they don't even see the marquee above them. And the crowd that was going in to see the triple X rated sex girls of Europe dynamic, in color, wide, erotoscope screen. They're all going in, see? <laughs> and they're walking through the Sunday school class, all these guys, you know, these furtive-looking characters, you know. They had just left the adult bookstore across the street, see, where they're getting adult books. And now they're walking through uh, this this crowd of Sunday school kids going into, <laughs> going into this. These kids are all looking very excited. And uh, so I get this, this, uh, 
this press release scene, it says, uh, it says, due to Victorian taboos, there are many things, the really good things cannot be said in our magazine. The re ripping aside the curtain of shame, uh, which has so long oppressed the good people of the world. And uh, because we can't say many of these things, you ought to see their magazine, I want to tell you. It's the only magazine I've ever seen that, that as you, you just open up the, the brown sealed wrapper, see, and lay it on the desk, it actually, if it's quiet enough in the room, you can hear it sizzling. Uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic, uh, you know, and there's a little smoke coming up off of it, you know, and it's just incredible. And, and, uh, and one issue they had, actually, Barney, it was fantastic. It's the only magazine I've ever seen that actually sweats. The magazine was sweating when I opened it up. It was just, you know, oh, yes, you could see the musk comes drifting out, you know. So at that point, uh, I, I kind of felt good about this. I'm reading this, uh, this, uh, re this uh, press release, and it says, we ripped aside the sunder, we sundered the, the uh, curtain of shame. And due to the fact that we can't say many of these things in our magazine, which we would say if ours was a liberated society, well... Uh, we have now instituted a special service for editors only. <laughs> and it said under separate wrapper, you will receive the first installment of our special service, the stuff we can't put in our magazine. It's a tape service. It says due to the fact that we cannot send out the printed word with this stuff on it, we now have available these tapes, the stuff which we cannot put in our magazine due to the ridiculous... Victorian taboos. And then underneath it was the final crowning glory. Would you please get ready to give me a little music there? Just hold it for a minute, Barney. Was the final crowning glory. It says, feel free to use any of these tapes you desire on your radio program. However, providing you give proper credit where it is due. And so tonight, let us salute those Victorian taboos which have suppressed so many of us in the last 10 years. Oh, God, if those Victorian taboos were not around, just think what we could do. The total, the total enjoyment, the true exploration of life and experience that we could have. Ridiculous Victorian taboos. Hold it there, Barney. That's enough, that's enough. I was playing you a little Victorian taboo music. And uh, I kind of like the idea, though. You can't send it through the mail, but you can use it on your radio show. Providing a proper... Here it is, right here. I'm holding it up. Woo, 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 that damn thing is hot. What the heck? How, how can he make a hot tape like that? It's actually... Oh, I can't... Oh, my hand. Hey, listen, I have a special thing here for you tonight. No, I'm not going to play the tape. Now, uh, I would, uh, at this point, like to, uh, to uh, very seriously uh, say something here. You know, I've been delighted uh, in some ways and sort of sickened in others at the the current vast interest in, uh, for want of a better name, I think it's unfortunately kind of a put-down name, but uh, uh, I suppose you can say Americana. Uh, this is getting to be a, a really, you know, almost a national mania, which in some senses is good because I think it gives us a sense of a national identity. I think a lot of people, particularly people who live in the big cities, don't really relate to the fact that they are Americans. They, they keep thinking of themselves as New Yorkers or uh, Greeks or, uh, or Chicagoans or whatever it might be. And uh, we are a genuine nationality now. I suppose you might say the whole world of American aesthetics, uh, which very quickly deviated from the, the European aesthetics, which were very popular uh, when the first settlers came over here into this country, and they began to develop their own style and uh, their own kind of uh, music and art. There's nobody, for example, in all of Europe who even remotely resembles uh, a great painter which operated in the 19th century. Uh, I'll give you a, a little quiz here. A painter who painted the West primarily. Who was that, Lee? You would probably know that. Great. Uh, he did great uh, paintings of, uh, of uh, cowboys. What was his name? That's right. Whippy Jones. Uh, it looks like you said, I'll just see whether you know. We'll just give you, yeah? Right, that's correct. And what was his first name? That's right, Frederick Remington. And uh, this, of course, he created a great sensation in Europe when, uh, when Remington's work began to be seen because there was nothing in Europe like it. 
uh, he, the whole genre that he chose, his colors, for example, were specifically American. Why? Well, because he wrote prim he, he drew primarily in the West. And as you know, if you've traveled throughout the West, uh, the, the colors out there are primarily ochres and browns and, and burnt greens and stuff, and that was his colors. Now, in addition to that, uh, there were other great uh, artists who, who uh, set the tone for America. For example, there was a great American uh, who came later who did that for the city. Who was that? Uh, he was from Philadelphia. All right, his name is Henry, Robert Henry, H-E-N-R-I. And he was, the, uh, he was the guy that painted the great city street scenes. In fact, you've probably seen examples of it. Uh, the, one of his most famous uh, uh, pictures was real, uh, uh, in a sense, a milestone was a thing called Sunday Morning, and it just shows a, a, a line of red brick buildings on a on a street in a city. You ever see that? Just a curious, moody quality to it. And uh, again, this uh, nothing like that was seen in Europe. Uh, they they uh, uh, and American writers who who established a whole. Uh, genre of writing. Certainly one of the best is Mark Twain. You know, they appreciate our writers more overseas than they do here. I'm talking about real American writers. Uh, Mark Twain uh, is, is, you know, he's just admired vastly in Europe because he wrote about an American experience which none of them had ever had. Uh, uh, he wrote about Life on the Mississippi. is probably the greatest book that he wrote. And uh, that, that uh, to me, uh, is probably one of the most successful books in, ever in the history of publishing in Europe. Uh, where people are fascinated by a whole continent laying here. Of course, we accept it. So all these people created the American aesthetic. Uh, and and uh, the Europeans still look at us with great fascination. You see, for example, Alastair Cook, who is an Englishman, and uh, he can't get enough of examining America. I, I personally am that way. I, I, my, my show, my television show, Gene Shepard's America, which was basically an examination of America, uh, in writing, uh, I've, I've found that most of the people who react to my work are European, curiously enough. Did you know that Punch uh, did a satire of Wanda Hickey's Night of Golden Memories? <laughs> the New Yorker probably doesn't even know it exists. And so the, the European, he can look at us, you see, and see what's coming out. And for that reason, we ought to start talking about the things which we have created, which were unique. I'm talking about the art world, not necessarily the art, but the culture, the culture of our, of our, of our world. Andy Warhol is specifically American, uh, and, uh, and of course that's uh, contemporary, but then you go all the way back to the earliest writers uh, and uh, painters, and you find that beginning already to emerge in those earliest days. For example, uh, Ambrose Bierce, whom uh, a lot of people will, will classify as one of the great bitter satire, satirists of the, the Devil's Dictionary of the late uh, 1800s, and uh, he set the tone of the cynical, hard-boiled American writer. There was nobody like that in Europe, that kind of cynical, hard-boiled, uh, put-down writer, in a sense, a kind of a Lenny Bruce of the printed page. They didn't have that in Europe. Their sat satirists were generally much more classical and uh, far more, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, less r r cutting. One of the great American writers who set a tone and uh, he's kind of an eclipse today, but I think by uh, the year, probably 1990, he'll have a great comeback, will be H.L. Mencken. Uh, Mencken was another one. But uh, these were all the great Americans who came and went and uh, had their say and established the, the tenor of our world. Now, probably the, the biggest cliche of all, though, is what America has done in the world of music. Uh, our music uh, has, has literally revolutionized the world's music. You can't listen to even the Russian composers today without hearing echoes of Gershwin, uh, certainly echoes of, uh, of earlier jazz musicians. Now, back in the 19th century, now we're getting into something, America was also a technical country. It was one of the first countries, really, where everybody in the country was fascinated by technical things, the cars, and the, we were one of the first countries that everybody wanted a typewriter. We had electric light bulbs hanging. After all, Edison was the consummate basement uh, do-it-yourselfer. We call it an inventor, but he, he was, you know, he's really hung on this. The Wright brothers and all these people, Henry Ford, and there were other inventors in, in Europe, but it was a common grassroots movement in America. 
In other words, the inventor was a grassroots character in America. Every American had a, had a dream of inventing something that would be greater than a safety pin. Uh, how many times have you heard that cliche? And you know, the guy that invented the safety pin, just to say, he made millions. <laughs> so every American has had this fugitive dream of, of coming up with this funny thing made out of a rubber band, which automatically would revolutionize the world and make him rich and famous and he can buy Cuba. But uh, one of the uh, great, uh, I suppose you can say one of the great contributions uh, to uh, the world music is rarely discussed. It combined technique, in other words, technicality. It combined technicians. It combined technicians and aesthetics in a curiously American way. And in, it, it happened right after the Civil War. There were three or four inventors, a guy named Needham, among others. Uh, he was given general credit for being one of the first patentees. Uh, they began to explore the idea of producing music. Now, up to this point, music was something people played. Producing music in a mechanical way. So, uh, that, that uh, had been, there had been several other experiments uh, around the world to do that, but it never caught on. Not like it would in America, because America was already pro-technology. Uh, and so, these guys began to experiment with the idea of producing music in a, in a technical fashion. Now, when they did it, they, 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 they tried several ex uh, instruments. You know, most people would think in terms of automatically the, the, uh, the pianola, you know, the, the uh, uh, piano roll, the automatic piano. But did you know that they had, uh, they had uh, automatically operated violins? Did you know that? Did you know that they also had, had banjos that played themselves? Yes, they did, with rolls. They not only had banjos, uh, they had pipe organs, giant pipe organs that would sit there and play you the entire B minor mass <laughs> all by itself. They, and, and they were always doing this stuff. Well, well the, the, uh, the old player piano was truly an American thing, and it took off like a bomb. As a matter of fact, in the year 1900, there were more pianos produced piano players, player pianos produced, then the population uh, was growing. In other words, if the population was growing by 700,000 people a month, and the population was growing fantastically in 1900, they were producing more player pianos. Everybody wanted a player piano, and everybody had, like today, television, everybody's going to have one. And, uh, and now this was before the world of jazz, though. See, a lot of the music that they played, and they put on these pianolas, as they call them, uh, they also called them the Aeolian. Uh, the o Aeolian, incidentally, was a brand name. So was Pianola. Actually, they were really technically player pianos. But uh, the, you know how the word today, the people say Victrola. Well, that's a, a brand name. Victrola was the RCA one. But here is an example now. Uh, if you've never actually heard a real player piano, uh, these are, are transcriptions taken directly from a player piano. And it's a great collection. Uh, there is some research going on, and I'd like to suggest more, because I, I, I must say that I was one of the first guys to suggest this, that the, that the early jazz musicians, I'm talking about the people that came out of New Orleans back around 1890, 1889, up through that period, were vastly influenced by the player piano. This is the music they actually heard. Hardly anybody recognizes the influence of the player piano on the Buddy Boldens and the people uh, who came later in, in the jazz history. Now, uh, the people of that period, in 1880, 1890, 1870, all that period, up through right after the Civil War, 1863 on, uh, there was a curious mixture of what could be called uh, proletarian taste, and yet everybody wanted to have a elegance in the living room. Uh, there was a desire for culture uh, in the old European sense, and so people would buy prints of, uh, of uh, Rembrandt and hang them in their living room, even though they were living on a, a desperate farm out in the Dakotas someplace. And here's an example of that. This is one of the first examples of a player piano roll that combines that curious taste, but that curious overtone of symphonic uh, culture. And it's a piece of music called Bubbling Spring that was very, very popular in the late 1870s on the player pianos of the period. 
and it was heard by all kinds of people, probably including uh, uh, the statesman. That's the one you've got up there. That's the first one I gave you. You got it in there? Okay. This is taken directly from a player piano, and it is a player piano playing it. It's not a man uh, transcribing it, and this is the way it sounded. You notice this has a certain quality of, uh, of, of what could be called really uh, middle ground classical music. But at the same time, it has overtones of popular music. Now, for those of you who are curious about the people that were affected by player pianos, among them was the famous Scott Joplin. Uh, Scott Joplin, who wrote, uh, uh, the, <laughs> most people would know it as the, the theme music of The Sting, uh, the maple leaf rag and all those great rags that he wrote. He was a great listener to and player for these pianos. He played on these things. play some more of this. We've only got about five minutes, so take that one off, Barney. That was that was called uh, R uh, Rippling Spring, and uh, it was very popular and one of the biggest sellers of the period on the piano rolls. People would go out and buy a roll, you see, just the way we buy an LP today. They'd go out and buy a roll and they'd bring it home and, and put it on the piano, and it was a fantastic moment when a new roll would arrive and a whole new song would be heard. Now, the rag... Uh, uh, you, you heard the expression ragtime. It was a specific American form of music, and this really swept the world. And it affected many jazz performers. Ragtime was a combination of many types of music, and it was pre-jazz, really. And Scott Joplin was probably the most famous of all the rag composers. However, there was another man who was considered even better uh, at the time as a rag composer. His name is James Scott. This was done on a U.S. music roll, and it was a big smash hit uh, roughly in the early 19, or rather early 1890s, and it's called Sunburst Rag. So if you think the sting uh, was unique, listen. And this was a tremendous hit during the gay 90s, during the so-called gaslight era. The rags, if you go into the technicality of them, they represent, they represent a, a curious offshoot of the earlier French minuet. Yes, they do. Uh, and, and it can be traced right through that. knows who actually played this. You see, these piano players were anonymous for the most part, but they were highly paid. It took a great technical artistry to be able to cut one of these piano rolls. You had to cut it right the first time. You couldn't go back and edit the tape. <laughs> and they had a special piano as they would play it. It would, it would perforate the tape as it went through. This is the sunburst rag. Could be more American. <laughs> we 
Would you like to do some more of this uh, during the week? Well, I have a whole collection of these, and uh, and I could uh, really give you some insight into, you know, through listening to this, the the origin of a lot of the great American sounds, which have really revolutionized world music. Uh, I think among all the arts, I don't think uh, there's one other one art that represents more a really an American art than music, particularly popular music. You know, the idea of popular music was almost unknown until around the year 1900. There were popular songs, but uh, America with uh, all of its uh, Tin Pal Alley and its its George Gershwins and that whole crowd. By the way, did you know that Gershwin uh, earned uh, a great part of his early livelihood playing for piano roll companies, making piano rolls when he was totally unknown? And uh, Gershwin piano rolls still exist, where, uh, you know, Gershwin was just playing somebody else's music, popping away there, doing his job. But the piano roll pianists were highly paid. They were great technicians. And uh, a lot of the music uh, was very original and written for piano rolls. And so the next time we come out with this uh, piano roll thing, which will be sometime later in the week, I'll play some music that was written only for piano rolls and can only be played on piano rolls. Very complicated stuff. And that's the world of Gene Shepard, which comes to you by recording from New York. And as I mentioned at the beginning of our program, that's the last Shepard program we'll be hearing for at least the duration of the summer. The programs have run out, and uh, we hope to resume broadcasting of them next fall if we can somehow get together some of the programs. In the meanwhile...